Hello. With White Dwarf recently releasing its official 500th issue, I thought this would be a good moment to take a quick look at the history of Games Workshop's long-standing fourth estate. Where did it come from? Why was it created? How has it changed and evolved? And perhaps some of its greatest moments. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm documenting a short history of White Dwarf. White Dwarf is the in-house magazine for Games Workshop, providing gamers with a regular catalogue of new releases, inspiration for their armies and miniatures in the form of painting and conversion guides, showcases of the greatest painted models you will ever see in heavy metal, background stories, lore, and new rules for the various Warhammer games, features and advice about collecting armies and building up forces, designing scenarios and playing campaigns, and of course, some of the most memorable battle reports ever fought. And all of that could be in just one issue. This is truly going to be a short history, just a brief exploration of the origins and evolutions of the magazine on its long journey. There have been 500 issues over 47 years, 17 permanent editors and countless contributors, and there have been a great deal of twists and turns along the way. In fact, it's a fascinating story, and Stay tuned to the end of this video where I'll talk about something in a bigger project I'd like to explore around White Dwarf's history. But before we get started today on this quick overview of the entire story, why not subscribe to the channel and give this video a like if you like it. And of course, you can check out my Patreon via the link in the description below if you want to support the work that I do here on the channel. So, White Dwarf, where did it begin? The first issue of White Dwarf started in 1977 as a bi-monthly RPG magazine, but before that there's a quick bit of pre-history. Steve Jackson, John Peake and Sir Ian Livingston had founded Games Workshop in 1975, and they quickly decided that they should create a zine that could advertise and review the products that they were selling in their retail business. All the better to help grow the Games Workshop brand and the UK gaming community. That newsletter was called Owl and Weasel, and for 25 issues it charted the growth of the workshop, a rising fascination with Dungeons and Dragons, and the changing nature of the UK's gaming market. Historical war games had become less prominent, board games were doing well, and RPGs were growing exponentially. Soon enough, Jackson and Livingston felt that they needed something more professional to help the company grow further. So they took a massive risk, ending the newsletter and investing heavily in a brand new magazine, one that would be called White Dwarf. They chose that name because it could appeal both to science fiction fans, given that it's a stellar phenomenon, and to fantasy fans, given that it's a, you know, dwarf. The first issue was released in June of 1977, and featured an amazing cover by artist Chris Beaumont, and the beautiful Art Deco title font Arnold Bocklin. Inside, you will find plenty of support for TSR and D&D, with articles about Metamorphosis Alpha, competitive Dungeons & Dragons, and advice for running D&D campaigns. And there was also Don Turnbull's mathematical Monster Mark system, for rating the lethality of enemies, which is like that one meme brought to role-playing life. That first issue set the tone for what White Dwarf would be in its first era. It was going to focus predominantly on this newfangled trend of role-playing games, and of course, the great innovator amongst them, Dungeons & Dragons. It would be about the entire industry of the tabletop game, but it was very clear at this time that the tabletop game industry was heading towards RPGs. Across the first hundred or so issues, there would be a wealth of content for D&D, including the famous Fiend Factory, a regular feature that would offer DMs fan-submitted monsters for inclusion in their games, with highlights like Albi Fiore's Lichway and Daniel Colleton's Irillion, a complete city for AD&D. As Games Workshop began producing their own RPGs and editions, there would be plenty of amazing scenarios and ideas for a broad range of role-playing games, content for the likes of Call of Cthulhu, RuneQuest, Golden Heroes, Star Trek, Traveller, and Judge Dredd. It wasn't exclusively RPGs all the way down, though. There were other games included in the magazine, too. In fact, in that first issue, 
there had been the first appearance of the open box review column, which would review pretty much anything that came out in the tabletop space, and soon there would be other features added as well. From issue 11 in 1979, there would be a regular advert for Citadel Miniatures, the new company that had been founded by Jackson Livingston and Brian Ansell to make figures exclusively for Games Workshop, including a range of minis that would represent all those monsters from the Fiend Factory. In issue 39, David Langford's Critical Mass column would begin as a regular review of genre fiction. From 43, we would be treated to the comic strip Gobbledygook by Bill Sedgwick, and he'd be joined by Carl Critchlow legendary Thrud and Mark Harrison's sci-fi romp The Travellers from issue 45. As if that wasn't enough firsts, it was in that same issue that White Dwarf would first cover Warhammer Fantasy with Thistlewood, a Warhammer adventure by Joe Diva. Issue 52 would see Diva, along with Gary Chalk, launch a new regular feature that reviewed and showcased miniatures, something of a precursor to heavy metal, called Tabletop Heroes. From issue 73, there was even a regular movie review column called 2020 Vision that started by tackling the remarkable 1985 double bill of Back to the Future and The Goonies. By 1986's issue 74, Ian Livingston would finally hand over the reins as editor after an unrivaled nine-year run. Ian Marsh would take over, but within just a few issues, the team would change again. This was around the time when Brian Ansell, who would become owner of Games Workshop, relocated the company to Nottingham, and though White Dwarf held out a little longer than everyone else, it too eventually had to move to Robin Hood country. Of course, feelings about it were laid out clearly in the contents page of issue 77. In the following issue, we would see the first appearance of Heavy Metal, featuring a range of scenes set up for the Judge Dredd RPG, featuring some incredible Citadel miniatures and dioramas. As Games Workshop and Citadel miniatures became more closely entwined, that could be seen very clearly in White Dwarf, not just because there were more features about Warhammer and Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, but because there were less features, almost none, about everything else. This would soon become an in-house magazine. The speed of this only increased from issue 93 onwards, with the launch of Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. New regulars like Chapter Approved and Index Astartes would begin providing plenty of new material for 40k, and by issue 107, the magazine had become exclusively tied to Games Workshop's games and releases. That was also the first issue to feature a battle report, a submission from Robin Dews that told the story of a 24-hour charity game, with over 13,000 points on each side of the battle. In time, both Jews and the Battle Report would become mainstays of the magazine. There would be a long history of White Dwarf struggling to find a permanent name for its news section. At times, it would just be called News or News Board. At others, it would be called stuff like Culture Shock, Fracar, and my personal favourite, Awesome Lies. And as Warhammer Fantasy and 40k evolved into family-friendly boxed games, so too did White Dwarf take on new hues and tones. By issue 136 in 1991, the battle reports were featuring colour photography, and you'd also find a short story that had been intended for the GW Books publishing line printed there as well, one of many pieces of wonderful fiction that would find its way into the pages of White Dwarf. With November 1992's issue 155, the first cardboard inserts could be found included in the magazine. By this point, White Dwarf achieved something of a zen-like state, regularly providing previews, adverts, rules and fluff for some of the best games GW would ever release. Issue 191 in November 1995 would bring about some big changes for the magazine. This was the Fat Dwarf era, so called because the page count increased by around a third, and they introduced new features like the Tale of Four Gamers, which followed four GW staff spending their monthly pocket money wisely to help build a fearsome fantasy fighting force. This is a run of White Dwarf that I remember particularly fondly, not just because the games it was writing about were great, but because it would also feature classic content, like the full tilt game by Nigel Stillman and his Stillmania columns, and it continued running the global campaigns, like the Third War for Armageddon. With issue 263 and the launch of the Lord of the Rings games, White Dwarf would find itself split in two, given a Gollum-like split personality, featuring a cover on both sides of the 
magazine. You could flip the whole thing around to read the Middle Earth content from one side, or approach it from the other to get your fix of fantasy and 40k. There would be a number of free miniatures given away with White Dwarf through the years, including a Metal Necron, Aeonur Sword of Twilight for Mordheim, a random Empire Wizard, a Bretonian Archer or a Skink to celebrate Warhammer's 5th edition, or a Dark Eldar for the 3rd edition of 40k launch. Features, editors and contributors would come and go over the next 100 or so issues, and then something would befall White Dwarf that was both unexpected and for some, unwanted. White Dwarf would stop being fat and instead become extraordinarily thin. The final monthly White Dwarf issue in its initial run was released in January 2014, which, despite for some reason refusing to have a number on the cover to acknowledge the fact, was its 409th publication. The magazine had increasingly seemed to focus more on the showcasing of new releases and painted miniatures, features that had of course been present since the beginning, but which some felt had crowded out much of the hobby and game content by this point. Whether in the pursuit of creative refresh, a new marketing strategy, or due to sales related factors, from February 2014 the magazine was replaced with White Dwarf Weekly. This now weekly magazine had a lower page count than its monthly ancestors, and though it featured much of the same content in concept, it was certainly more slight in execution. At the same time, a new monthly magazine premiered, Warhammer Visions, which was described as featuring the best painted miniatures in the world in a glossy showcase magazine. For roughly the next two years, White Dwarf remained on a weekly schedule alongside Warhammer Visions, and then in September of 2016, there was a brand new, bumper, content-filled monthly White Dwarf. Since then, the magazine has reclaimed and rebooted classic features like the card inserts, the Tale of Four Gamers, though it's now called Tale of Four Warlords, and even, pleasingly, the issue number has returned to the cover, with January 2020's issue 450 marking the start of a new numbering. Officially, the White Dwarf weeklies are not included in the count. In more recent times, the magazine has split its contents by the worlds of 40k and Age of Sigmar, and it has included a community section called the White Dwarf Bunker. And that brings us to issue 500, an issue that does rightly celebrate its long legacy, but of course presents the hobby as it's seen today by Games Workshop. I guess that was ever thus, and Ian Livingstone in his book Dice Men had this to say. Whilst White Dwarf featured some fantastic articles and artwork, it was, of course, an important platform to promote Games Workshop's games and shops. And thankfully, along the way, the many talented, creative contributors to the magazine have found plenty of opportunities to sneak in alongside the ads, all of the guidance, inspiration, value, and most importantly, fun that I could ever want in my hobby. I love White Dwarf, and though of course I think there have been greater and lesser eras of the magazines, ones where the swing between advertising and hobbying has gone unfavourably, or my favourite games seem to get short shrift, I am still so grateful that it even exists. I mean, to think that there is a magazine dedicated to showing me pictures of my favourite games, my favourite toys essentially, that tell stories in these worlds that exist mostly in our imaginations, and that it, it has been published for 47 years. I think that that is quite remarkable, to be honest, and I really do hope that it exists for at least another 47 years as well. In truth, I love White Dwarf so much that my original intentions for this video was not so much a quick overview but a far more detailed exploration of White Dwarf's history through the lens of each of its editors, to take a look at the context in which it was written, and the people who were writing it, and the market that was buying it, the company that was publishing it, to try and bring together all of that into a single story that examines how White Dwarf has changed and what that can tell us about Games Workshop and the UK gaming market as a whole. I think that that would be a fascinating undertaking, but of course that's an enormous undertaking as well. So I didn't want to dive feet first into it uh, without at least seeing what people thought. So rather than me get started on that, given that I'm already working on a making of Warhammer Fantasy and a making of Warhammer 40,000 series, I wanted to give you the chance to let me know 
if that's something you would like to see. Do you want to see a series about White Dwarf broken up by editor looking at the history and the context in which the magazine was released? Let me know in the comments below. I would really appreciate your guidance on this one. In any case, this is where I must leave you for now. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to like the video if you did enjoy it. Please share this video. Please tell people about the Jordan Sorcery channel. And of course, if you have the means, please feel free to check out my Patreon. That support is the only way I can keep doing this work. So I really greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jordan and this is Jordan Sorcery. In case you're wondering, my favourite issue of White Dwarf probably doesn't come from the White Dwarf Weekly era. In fact, if you want to know what my favourite is, then you can check out my five faves video about White Dwarf right here.